grandson, Carson, who is 10 years old, taught his Sunday school class yesterday. Oh. I wonder where he gets that. Yeah, I wonder where he gets that. My, my mother-in-law counterpart goes to church with him, and she sent me pictures of him setting up his table. He apparently had some kind of a leg of something for a, you know, you got to have help. I mean, you know, so, and he was praying for his for his group, and so, I just, it just it just melted my heart. It just did. It was just so, so special, so. All right, as I was working today, uh, well, I'll tell you this in a minute. There's, there's so many ways, chapter 3, there's so many ways that this chapter could go. As I've been working on so many questions that this chapter raises, so much we don't understand, so much we could spend our time, and we could spend our whole time just dissecting the questions that we have. Uh, and I do want to spend some time doing that. But like we've done uh, with, with chapters 1 and 2, we'll spend most of our time just looking at how God said it happened. You may remember in our first lesson we said there are many ways that God could have created everything, but how did he say that he did it? That's, that's what I want to know. That's what I want to focus on. That's all I really want to know. So when, when Satan says to me, has God really said, I want to say, Yes, God really said, and point out where it was. You, you, you know the quote, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Well, God said it, and that settles it, whether I believe it or not. But let me add this. As I was working on this today, it became really evident, really quick, that we're not going to finish this chapter tonight. <laughs> I mean... You know, you th chapter 3 of Genesis, oh yeah, everybody know what chapter 3 is. You know, the, the serpent uh, tempted Eve, and she ate, she gave to Adam, and they ate, and her eyes was opened, and you know, God caught them. And, uh, yeah, we know it. But the more I've studied that, I'm, I mean, and I'm not talking about those wild questions we have. Just the stuff in the Scripture. So, I really, really hate to divide this chapter up especially because we're not going to be here the next two weeks. Uh, election next week and then and then uh, spring break. I really hate to do that, but I would rather do that than try to cram it all in. There, there's just so much here that I really want to share. So we, uh, what I'm going to do, we'll just see how far we get. I mean, I've got enough finished about it that... that to well cover our time, but we'll just see how far we go, and if we don't get that far, we'll pick up there next time. So, just sit back and relax and, and enjoy the time. So, before we jump into the scripture, though, what are your thoughts? What did you notice? What did you learn? What surprised you? What did you think it said, only to discover, no, that's not what it really said at all. Any questions from the uh, uh, the overview sheet or the uh, the study sheet? Anything you want to share at this point? You know, it's it's always I've had a question um, if God created it, He meant for us to enjoy it. Right. Okay. So why did He tell them that they couldn't enjoy the tree of life? The tree of life? I, mean, I, I don't under. I thought all His creation was for us to enjoy, and that was. Why he created it? It is. It is. But it's always kind of, you know, and that that one, and we will talk a little bit more about that a little later as we go along. But but that's always a question. And he knew they were going to do that. So why even put it there? The 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 short answer is, if they had had no choice, they would have had no choice to love it. As we said last time, love, or in one of the lessons, love has to be reciprocated. You have to be free not to love in order for love to be a choice. And and we will talk a little bit more about that tree. It was not put there as a trap. It was not put there as a trick. It was put there. Again, God knew what they were going to do. They didn't know what they would do. And so it was put there for them to understand that they did not trust God. And they did, the whole theme, you know, from the very first lesson, I said the, 
just what I've seen as a theme in all of my reading and studying is trust and obey. That's what this is all about, trust and obey. They did not know what they would do, and God had to show them that they were trusting themselves and not trusting him. That, that's the short answer, and that's the bottom line. And like I said, we'll talk a little bit more about it. But is that, does that clear that up? Yeah. It's not an entrapment. It's, it's not a trick. It's not, a, I'll show you. I'm going to put it there, but you can't have it. It's it, Well, someone like last Tuesday morning had a really good answer for that. They said, <laughs> it's, like, it's like a child. Well, they said when we were talking about if you eat from it, you will surely die. So did they even know what die was? They didn't know what die was. They'd never seen anything die. Nothing dies until after chapter 3. But the, this lady said that what it was is like you tell a child not to do something or it, this will happen. They may not have a clue what that something is, but do they trust what you're telling them? Whatever that something is, it's bad. I may not know what it is. I may not know, you know, if you say to someone, you know, this will cause third degree burns. You may not have, not have a clue what a third degree burn is. But if someone you trust tells you that, then you trust that it's bad. Whatever it is, it's bad. So that's, they had to learn to trust God. That was the whole point. What else? I guess that explanation could also apply to the serpent. Because in my mind, why would there even be a serpent in the Garden of Eden? Mm -hmm. This was before the apple was a... I, mm -hmm. mean, I look at the serpent as the evil one. He is the evil one. And, exactly. And why would the evil one be in a perfect garden created for man and woman mm -hmm. to and mankind to live an unbelievable life? There's the evil one. Yeah. Right yeah. there. In there. In paradise, in paradise, right there in paradise. That's I, exactly I, right. I, I and that's, that, I don't know how many times. That's I'm a like, that's an you? area that has caused a, a, a lot of discussion, a lot of disagreement, and how there are some that think that God couldn't have put him there because why would a loving God put him there? Mm -hmm. But what we have to look at is wasn't that God put him there? God allowed him. To be there, just like with us today, we know that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. The way he's described, he has he has free reign to come and go, and he had free reign to come and go there. What did he look like? That's that you know. What did the snake look like? It looked like a snake. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Now, the, what we do know about him, we have, we have two places in Scripture, and I think I may have put that. Yeah. Uh, at, down at the bottom where it says verse 5 we have Isaiah 14 verses 14 and 15 well actually it's further than that this is just particularly about verse 5 but uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 is the two places that you can read about Satan uh, along with Revelation 12 and Revelation 20 there are very few places in scripture that we have any description of him, uh, there, uh, there's another one in Luke, I can't remember the chapter, where Jesus says, I saw him fall from heaven like lightning. And that, that was a, it was one of those things that was a past tense. I saw, you know, we, we talked last time in chapter two about, um, chapter two was not in chronological order. Chapter 2 gave us the parts of information when that information was there. gave us the details when the details were, were pertinent to the story. So it's the same way in Ezekiel and Isaiah and, and Revelation and Luke. All, all those little snippets of information we have about Satan are not in chronological order, even to that text of Scripture. Some of it is past tense, and you got to know the tenses of the word. And I did notice that the, the NIV is, is pretty good about giving the past tenses of words. So uh, you, you got to if you don't if you're not careful, you'll read it out of out of its sequence. But we know from the Ezekiel passage what he looked like when God created him. I mean, he was a cherubim. He was uh, many scholars believe that he was. Uh, not just one of the archangels, he was the archangel. And when he willed, he, I will be like God, I will, that's in the Isaiah uh, 
scripture, I will ascend to heaven, I will do this, I will do that, I will be like God, that when he fell, then God created the, the four cherubim, you know, with the four faces that, that, you know, we see in Ezekiel. That that's what he looked like originally. He was the only one, but when he fell, then God divided up that that um, um, I don't use the word power, a responsibility among the four. And cherubim. Every time we see cherubim, they are in a position of guarding God's holiness. They are around the throne, the seraphim and the cherubim. They are around the throne. They are they are protecting God's holiness. And uh, the Ezekiel scripture says you you are a covering cherub, meaning you were a, a guardian cherub. Now, some believe that that means he was guarding the garden, but uh, my opinion on that is is that that's not what that means because it was perfect. What would you guard against somebody like him from coming in? But he he just is, and I'll talk more about him in his position there when, when we get to that, but he's just there. He has access. To Makes that. you wonder why he was privileged to know about the tree of life and yeah. I mean yeah. how did he know? Yeah. Yeah, how did he I mean he he saw he saw all of that being created. And uh for a couple two or three of you here when when we did that Advent series that we talked about uh, it, it, the title of it was The Plot to Overtow to Sabotage Christmas. And we looked at all the ways that Satan sought to try to stop the birth from happening. And it begins here. It begins here and we, we traced it out. But, um, that, that's what he, that's what he did. He was trying to stop it. But he was not omniscient. He, we say, well, Satan knows scripture better than we do. Of course we do. Of course he does, because he was around, he has been around for all of it. But as it's happening, he only knows it as it's happening. You've got to remember that. Here, he doesn't know what's going to happen in chapter 4. He doesn't know what's going to happen in chapter 6. He only knows what's happening in front of him. We know that from, I don't remember if it's First or Second Peter, where he talks about the angels look on with, with wonder, to paraphrase. So, does that make sense? So, could... Satan and his entourage have already been kicked out of heaven at this point, and could he have inhabited this serpent, mm -hmm. you know, like a, a demonic sort of mm -hmm. encounter with the serpent? Because it says that he was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm just... No, I think that's right. I think that's exactly right. He's come in this... This way and this mm -hmm. form. Mm -hmm. so, so I've got some really good commentaries that, that talk about that. Of course, we don't know that. We're not given that information exactly when it happened. That's how a lot of people believe in what we talked about, the gap theory between verse 1 and verse 2 of, of chapter 1, that all that took place during that period of time. But the Scripture doesn't tell us any of that. We don't know. But we do know that at the end of, or at the end of the week, the first part of chapter two, that everything was very good. And we, the, the belief that, that I follow, that a lot of the commentaries that I read follow, is that likely the angels, including Lucifer of the day star, remember that wasn't a bad name when he was given the name, that he, that they were all created probably on day one, along with the hosts of heaven. Hosts being stars, hosts being angels, that that's when they were created because we read in Job that the angel, that the, the, the host, uh, the, the sons of God rejoiced when the foundations were laid. So that's chapter one, verse two and three and, and that part. So that's where I, I place my understanding of that. That could be wrong. But that seems to be logical. But it's, it's but, a transitional word there now. Now, yeah. But that now, that's after this has happened, this mm -hmm, has gone on in yeah. twenty two. Now Right. So whenever it happened, if he fell at some point before verse one of chapter three. That much we know. Yeah. So exactly when, how, we don't have the details on it, but we know it's before here because he is inhabiting. And this thing. Yeah, the scheming, exactly. You know what I 
I thought was so funny is that after they had eaten of the fruit and they realized, you know, oh, oops, uh -oh. you know, and they hide among the trees of the garden. That yeah. were, I've never read that before. Yeah. You know, I, I knew they were ashamed and all that, but they're eating from this tree, and then they hide behind the, the tree. You Can't know, see me. I'm behind the tree. <laughs> yeah. And then I thought, too, um, the chair, if he, Satan was a chair, is that? Yeah. Because that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. Some yeah. of the scriptures yeah. that you Yeah, he was a chair. Okay, and it's ironic that that's what it's used to. Guard. Yeah. 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 Guard you know, you, there's so many of those. And I'll have to add that to my repertoire. There's so many of those things that we call recompense. <laughs> you know, like Haman was going to hang Mordecai, and then Haman ends up being hanged on it. You know, the, the uh, uh, Pharaoh's army was drowned in the sea, and he was going to drown the baby. I mean, so many of those recompense things that we see throughout Scripture. But yeah, I hadn't thought of that one. That's perfect. That he was a cherub, and he lost that, and now the cherubim, the one to guard, end up guarding the garden. <laughs> that's cool. That's a, that's a good point. I struggle with, okay, the serpent, and maybe this is, I've seen too many movies, but you inha he inhabits the serpent, mm -hmm. and then after Adam and Eve screw up, then... He says, hey, serpent, I'm going to make you crawl on the ground. Well, yeah. he's a serpent, that's sort of what he did all along. Yeah. Or did the serpent just come along to represent the devil or... Great, great question. I mean, because we lived in trees or something, you know. Yeah, I, I just... Yeah, yeah there, 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 there's this one commercial that... Cut, that it, it, you know, they seem to run in cycles. But, you know, those, those little ads that come on before YouTube videos, there's this one, and I forget even what it's for because I click off of it just as soon as it'll allow me to click off of it. It's some professor of some sort that's making fun of this, and he says, and the, and the serpent talked. And he told the serpent, you're going to have to roll in your belly. And, well, what do you, what do you think snakes do, y'all? You know, just... It just, oh, oh no, 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 no. I know, I know what you mean, but that it's, it was his attitude. Yeah. There's a difference between an attitude and an honest question. Yeah. You know? And so, yeah, that, that, that is a really good question. Did the snake have legs? Did, did snakes walk? You know, did, did they talk? Did, you know, what did it look like before, say, before God said, you'll go on your belly? My opinion on that is that God's not telling you anything, not telling the serpent anything new. Just go ahead, slither on on your belly, eat dust like you always have. You know, yeah. I don't think that's new. I think the, the other part of it, of what will happen, the curse, and the curse actually is for Satan, the old serpent, not for the snake as such. But uh, I, I thought... My opinion is, is he's just saying to the snake, just go on and do what you did to start with, you know. It's interesting that Satan picked the snake. Well, well I can it understand why. being very frightening, or they wouldn't have had a conversation with Exactly. Him. You know, it, it was obviously, look, you know, very uh, benign and beautiful even. I mean, it, it, there wasn't anything threatening about it. Of course, in our house, I, I keep a hole by every door. <laughs> And, and I don't just kill snakes, I mutilate them. I guess I'm not supposed to say that, but that's what I do. I just, I just hate them. So, but there was something about it that she wasn't frightened of it at all. Right? They didn't, they didn't have that knowledge. They didn't have, they didn't fear anything. There was no fear, period, at this time. There were, uh, even on up to the flood stage, there will be no fear. Between man and animal. I mean, the animals came, they came to Adam to name him, but they will come to Noah. You know, it's not like he has to round them up. They will come. There is no fear between God and man. That doesn't happen until after the flood. We'll read about that afterward. So there, there's no fear. that She had no reason to be afraid of him. And, and we'll see that again in the millennial reign. You know, it says, you know, the, the child will play around the nest of, of the snake. I'm like, not my child. <laughs> so, but, but yeah, what else? 
how could the early Jews know about Satan if Satan was never written about until Isaiah and Ezekiel? And that, that's a great question. I think, and again, this is, I'm just, we have that later information, but, but you're exactly right. They did not have that written down, but I think they they knew more of that I th because we know that Moses is compiling this. I think they probably knew a lot more about it than than we realize that they knew. But but I may be totally wrong on that. But but I, I think they did because of all the other gods that they were um, um, exposed to that they knew a lot more about. The, the Lucifer and, and as his name is changed to Satan and the deceiver. That, that, that's all I've, that's the best I've got on that. But, but, you know, I, I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm assuming since the sin happened and the sin continues in all of us, mm -hmm. that's how it's kind of an, an inbred. You yeah. know that there's, an, there's an evil out yeah. there. We know about evil. Yeah. Yeah. When their eyes were opened, as it says, and they knew, Good and evil, as we said last time, they only they only knew good before. They didn't know evil. Now they know what evil is, and the only way, and this kind of goes back, uh, Nanette, to your question, the only way that we can really understand what good is is to know that there's something that's not good. It's like the only way we really understand light is that there is darkness. They they had to know that there was an opposite mm -hmm. or or uh, an other side to that. So I, I think that that's probably right. I mean, we'll learn a lot more as you know as we go through this. And I and I'm like you all. I'm just studying it as we go. You know, I'm not doing way ahead and, and all. I just can't do any more than that. But uh, there may, there may be more that we learn later. But for now, I just think what Moses is compiling here goes with what they already knew at that point in their lives. Why did the serpent pick Eve? Why do you think he picked Eve? Because he sensed a weakness in her. Yeah. Just like he sensed a weakness in Judas. Exactly. I think that's exactly right. Every one of us has our weak points. Yeah, and they're different. Where Satan will tempt me is not the same place he will tempt you. Could he have known that God had given the command to Adam, don't eat? Oh, I think so. And so that's another reason why he might have went to her. Yeah, and that, that, that brings <laughs> up the question, and we talked a little bit about this last time. Was Eve there when God gave him that command? I think she was, but it doesn't say that she was, but we don't know. Yeah, but even if she wasn't there, even if she did not hear that command directly, Adam told her because she she tells him. Right. She didn't know it. Was a weakness of Adam. Well, exactly. Because Adam heard directly, "Do not do this." Yeah. And it's just like many of us, male or female, we can be easily manipulated, and and you know. He heard directly from God, and yet Eve says, "Oh, you, yeah, you know, yeah." So and I, I, and I think kind of losers <laughs> on that front. So. Well, then this this brings up another thought that was Adam there when the serpent was tempting her? Some of the commentaries say he wasn't, but if you read where she eats it, it says. Uh, uh, in verse 6, she took from its fruit and ate and gave also to her husband with her. It doesn't say she took it to him or brought it to him. He was with her. I think he was there the whole time, which exactly shows his weakness because he didn't speak up. No, we're not going to do that. And it was his responsibility to do that. Great questions. And what else? Because we, I mean, we'll, we'll bring up more as we go along or, or as you think of them. Anything else you want to touch on before we jump in? The sin was not the eating of the apple. The sin happened before the eating of the apple when Eve doubted God. Yeah. Yeah. She doubted God. 
but the consequence right. came from eating it. My mother, bless her heart, <laughs> I don't tell you how many times I've heard her say, well, you might as well say it as think it. I'm like, no, mother. <laughs> Keeping it in your mind will change it. You know, you can think all you, it's like I told Joe Jr. once as a teenager, I said, you think all you want to think, but once you say it out loud, I've got to do something about it. Right. So the consequence came from the eating of it. But, but you're right. When she doubted God, that was the sin. Being tempted was not the sin. Because we're all tempted. But it was the doubting God and and then which brought the next and then the disobedience. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you know, be sure, you know, bring up uh, uh questions, anything you want that you know, when we get to something, oh yeah, I meant to ask about that, you know, whatever, just do that. So we'll just see how far we go. So as we begin this study of chapter 3, we have to keep reminding ourselves who the first audience was and why Moses did this. Why did he compile this history? So obviously it's first for the Israelites. And, and this is the reason. To teach them about the Lord. Remember, all caps. Lord in all caps is Jehovah, their, the covenant God. To teach them about the Lord, their God. About Jehovah, about their covenant God, who is Elohim who is the supreme God, who is the source of everything. In Exodus 20, which you and I remember as the giving of the Ten Commandments, and a lot of times I'm finding myself, I will know what a section of Scripture is, but when we read the Ten Commandments, we're so focused on the Ten Commandments that we don't really focus on individual parts of it. In, in Exodus 20, uh, as, as God is giving this, it begins this way. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. I am that God, that God that Moses is writing about. I am that God. Moses was teaching that the same Lord God, that same Jehovah Elohim that brought him out of slavery is the same Lord God that created and ordered everything from the very beginning. I feel a sneeze coming on in case I... Moses, Moses did that by recounting the history, as Luke put it in his gospel, uh, in an orderly fashion. Luke said, I've recorded this gospel, this life of Jesus, in an orderly fashion. And so that's what Moses is doing. He's recording the history in an orderly fashion. So chapter 3 is within that word, the toledot, and we'll, we'll talk about that all through this study. The toledot or the chapter or heading that falls between chapter 2 verse 4 where it says this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made heaven and earth. Between that one and the one in uh, chapter 5 verse 1 which says this is the book of the generations of Adam. These are like chapter headings. Everything that we're going to be studying about in chapters 3 and 4, uh, 2, 3, and 4, fall in to that section, that Toledot, that, that history. Uh, we said uh, many scholars believe that Adam himself is responsible for this section. Some believe it was written down. Others believe that it was orally transmitted. But either way, whichever way it was, this first section, you might put a parenthesis from, from chapter uh, 2, verse 4, and chapter 5, verse 1. This section carries on the history of what happened to the heavens and the earth after they were created. And by the way, Henry Morris, in that uh, commentary of the Genesis record, believes that the Toledot, that, that, sign that, that uh, phrase, is a signature rather than a heading. In other words, that, that statement, this is the account of or the record of or the generations of, falls at the end of the section rather than at the beginning. My opinion is, is that it's both. I think it acts as a hinge. This is what came before and this is what came after it. Uh, but, but that's just my opinion. But as we ended chapter 2, Adam had just received his helper, which we said... That word helper is the same word that, that describes the Holy Spirit. I mean, th this is a very important position. This is not just, just an add-on or, or tacked on. This is very important. So, you know, if you missed last week's lesson, you might want to go back and watch it. But we were able to cover a lot more in that, that video than, um, 
than, than we did, uh, than we will in the next two classes. But we said that the woman was taken from Adam's side. And the Hebrew word that was used there, as you remember, is rib. Rib, we said, was not the best translation of that word. That word rib was not found anywhere else in the Bible. But as we learned about life, about how blood is made, blood, which is life, comes from the bone, then God inspired Moses to use that word. Plus, the word translated as rib is a picture of an arch. An archway cannot stand on one, one side of it, cannot stand. You've got to have both sides of it, and you've got to have the keystone before an arch will stand. Uh, but Adam received his helper. <laughs> Last week, those of you who know uh, uh, some of the folks at well, Amy, you know, uh, uh, my mind just went blank, Gail. Gail Bowers said, she said, I have a note down here that when, when in, in verse 23 of chapter 2, when, when God brought the woman to man, he said, wow. <laughs> so I heard one this week that said that when God brought the, the woman to man, that uh, he, he took one look at her and said, whoa, man. Oh, whoa, man. <laughs> so anyway, so so we read. In chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, and the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Those two words uh, work together. Verse 24, and Moses' commentary on that, and this is why, for this cause, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And then we come to verse 25 and it says, And the man and his wife, that same word as woman there, were both naked and were not ashamed. And and we immediately begin to anticipate, Why would you say that? The, this, this is going somewhere. It's just like, it's just like you know, when the movie, when, when the music changes in a TV program or a movie, you all say, Something's fixing to happen. The music's changed. So something's about to happen. The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Okay. So as we said last time, verse 25 is a hinge. It connects the details of creation in chapter 2 to what's going to happen next in chapter 3. And especially when verse 1, as we said a while ago, when verse 1 of chapter 3 begins, now the serpent, I were like, where did he come from? And obviously, you and I know what's going to happen next. But but if, like we've said, if you make yourself read it like you don't know what's going to happen next, you might say, wait a minute. Where did he come from? What's that got to do with the man and the woman in the king's private garden located in that delightful place? We're already wary because many of us don't like snakes to start with. And it seems it, it seems to be taking a step to say that there's more there than meets the eye. And remember, there's no chapter and verse breaks. So what is just said, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed, now the serpent, we immediately see something's about to happen. So, now the serpent was more crafty, or your translation may say cunning, or may say subtle, than any beast of the field which the Lord God there's that. We got to remember that title for Lord God is very important. That's the covenant God. That's the God who loves you. He was more crafty or cunning or subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So I, I was surprised as I was reading this. I was, I was just doing some searching on, on the words. And the word was. Is there, you know, as I said last time, a lot of times those words aren't in there. It's just a very curt language. It just jumps, it just says very succinctly what it's going to say. But the word was is a very important word. The serpent was there. The word was is the word exist. And I thought, huh. If you remember, we learned that the phrase, let there be, in chapter 1, was the word exist. We learned that in Exodus uh, 3, verse 12, when God says, I am, that's also the word, exist. But in chapter 1, the tense of the word is a command. God said to light, exist. And it existed. 
the tense of I am, you remember, it, it means it's it's a word, it's something with no completion date. In other words, eternal. God's eternal. Well, here it's an entirely different tense. The word tense here is a state of being. The serpent was. However we see the serpent right here in verse 1 is exactly how the serpent was. He was subtle. He was crafty. He, he was uh, cunning. It's his factual state of being at the time of this event. So depending on, on your translation, crafty, cunning, subtle, uh, he, he was more so than any other beast of the field. Now we remember that Adam had named all the animals, all the animals based on their characteristics. You know, what, however they moved, whatever they did, that's how their, their genetic name was given to them. So apparently the snake was beautiful. And the snake was smooth. That's what another meaning of that word. Probably in its movements. You know how a snake moves? They're very smooth in their movement. On your study sheet for chapter 3, I said that the English words naked and cunning, the word naked in, in verse 25 and the word cunning or crafty, whichever you have, come from the same root word. Because the words sound similar. Uh, it, it's, it's a, a, it's a, a Hebrew play on words. The Israelites would have picked up on it immediately. You, you and I don't, don't see it there. Here's what it is. The word naked is the word arom, A-R-O-M, and the word cunning is the word arum, A-R-U-M. See how they sound alike? Arom, arum, that, uh, but they sound a lot alike. So the Israelites, hearing this story, would have immediately picked up on that. It's it's like it's it, it was like a pun. It's like and I kept trying to come up with one, and then I saw one one day, and I wrote it down. I thought this is what I'm going to use. It's like this: if you don't use good sense, s e n s e, in your investments, you'll lose all your sense, c e n t s. You see, you see how those two words sound alike, but they mean entirely different things. That's that's what the Israelites would have seen. That's what they would have heard. And another thing, I, I didn't have this in here, but you're lying. What you said a while ago about them eating the apple made me think. We don't know, of course, what kind of fruit it was, but the, and I didn't write down what the Hebrew word for apple sounds very similar to the Hebrew word for evil. That's why we call it an apple because it sounds like the same word. So, but we don't really know what 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 kind of fruit it was. So the serpent was smooth. And in Matthew 10, 16, Jesus described the serpent as wise. However, Smith's dictionary said that this type of wisdom that, that the serpent had was wisdom apart from God, which denigrates into cunning. We think of cunning I mean, you know, it's, it's usually given a negative connotation. It's a bad thing when, when somebody is cunning. And again, Ezekiel 28, 17 tells us that Satan's wisdom was corrupted. He was, he was very intelligent, but his wisdom was corrupted. And remember that word corrupted. We'll see it over and over and over again in, in our studies. Satan corrupts the things that God creates as good. So, the snake was smooth, he was graceful, he was wise, apparently very attractive, and, and again, at this point, we start having even more questions. Just as we said at the beginning, we could spend our whole time on this, but let me, let me throw these out that you may have not thought of, or maybe you didn't, just didn't ask them. First, did this really happen, or is this just an allegory of how evil came into the world? Well... It really happened. Paul talks about it in um, 2 Corinthians 11.3 and 2 Timothy 2.13. Scripture attests that this was a real event. Was this a real snake? Yes, it was. Did the other animal speak or did just the snake speak? We don't know. Eve, as we said earlier, Eve doesn't seem to be too surprised. She doesn't seem to be frightened by it. It's just, she is kind of, he's just there. But then again, 
In Numbers 22, Balaam doesn't seem a bit surprised when the donkey turns around and talks to him. I don't know. So I, I, really, I really can't answer that. Did Satan's spirit enter the snake? Probably. We know that demons entered the swine in Matthew chapter 8 when Jesus cast them out of the, the uh, Gadarene demoniac. They went into the swine, so we know that happens. We also know that demons spoke through men in Jesus' day. So it's very, very likely that Satan's spirit entered into this, this serpent or this snake. Also, God called Satan a serpent in Revelation 12, 9 and Revelation 20, verse 2. Plus, here, here's the thing. The serpent spoke in a way that is in character with Satan. That is, he lied. And we know that Satan, it was it John 8, 44, Satan is the father of lies. So he was speaking in characteristic with Satan. So likely... It was Satan who possessed a literal snake. But God had made Adam and Eve to rule over the plants and the animals. But here Satan was able to make them subservient to a snake. I mean, there's a lot more questions that, that we could ask. But uh, if we look at how the event unfolded. So notice Moses is setting up the account. As he said, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And then he continues, And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said... Notice the title he uses for God there. He uses that supreme being, that, that maybe that cold... God, yeah, not Lord God, not the one that loves you and cares for you, that so lovingly made you, put all the, the details in in chapter 2, but God. Has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Notice exactly what he asked. Did God really say, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And here we find the very, as we've said, the very first everything, the very first case of revisionist theology. In other words, the changing or the questioning of what God said. That's what revisionist theology is. It changes what God has said. But we, we touched on this just a little bit. What prompted Satan to speak to a woman in the first place? Obviously, they're somewhere near the tree of, of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil. We're told back in chapter 2 that it's put in the midst of the garden. Wherever it is in the middle of the garden, that's where she was. She could have been anywhere else, but that's where she was. Was she admiring the tree? Did she have that look on her face as, I wonder what that tastes like. And then he said, did God say you couldn't eat from any tree? And by the way, the word you there is in plural. If you're reading the King James, it says ye shall not eat. That's how we know it's plural. So I believe Adam was there the whole time. Could this have been the time when Adam and Eve told her, don't eat of it? Maybe they were there. Could have been. Conversation at that point and then boom, here comes. Could have been. He, she could have been looking at it and then he said, if, if she was not there when God told him, she may have been looking at him and Adam gone, no, 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 can't eat from that one. And we don't know, did Adam say or touch it? Yes. We don't we don't know that, but we know that she I asked say a man saying just don't touch it. Just just just, 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 like uh, just, just don't. don't. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so I, I, the the yes. NIV yes. Yes. <laughs> see the NIV put it this way when we find it. Um, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? That that's like he put you out here and you can't have any of them. Did God, did God say that? So, so here, here's what I think. I think Adam begins by saying, did I hear God right? Implying 
that he has a sincere question. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but did God really say that you couldn't eat from any of the trees? But like we said, notice he used the term God rather than Lord God, implying that God is too strict or too harsh in contrast to the Lord God who is so loving and so caring. God said, did God say you couldn't have any of it? So first of all, Satan's plan is to, to plant a seed of doubt concerning God's good character and God's purpose to bless him. He, he, he said, don't focus on the abundance that God has given you. Just focus on that one that you can't have. So Satan asked, and what did Eve do? She did three things. She not only corrected the serpent, she embellished and exaggerated and she also minimized God's word as well. Look at verses 2 and 3. Verse 2 says, And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. So she, she corrected the serpent right off the bat. No, you, you didn't hear that correctly. We no, God said that we, we can't eat of them. But notice that's not exactly what God said. God said in uh, verse 16 of chapter 2, from any tree of the garden you may freely eat or eat freely. In other words, you can have all you want. You can eat freely, but she didn't say that. All she said was, is we can eat from them. Even that suggests a restriction. There's just so much you can eat. So first of all, she minimized God's word. And maybe revealed her feeling, maybe prodded by the servant, that, you know, maybe God was a little strict in his provision. So then she embellished, or she exaggerated, or she added to God's word. Uh, it said, from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God entered out of Now, she's not using Lord God either. She's just calling this cold calculating God. From the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it. So hold it right there for me. So so she she said God, and she said we may eat from it. And so perhaps she said, oh, no, no, we can eat from all the trees. It's just that we can't eat from this one beautiful, delicious-looking tree. Mine, oh, no. We can't even touch it, you know, pulling her hand back. I mean, reaching, pulling her hand back. We can't even touch it. No, we, we, we can't touch it. So you can't eat from it or touch it. But God didn't say anything about not touching it. I mean, we can, we can uh, have conjecture that, you know, that Adam told her not to touch it. You know, like, like Amy said, you know, don't, don't go there. Don't even touch it. But we, we're not told that. All we know is what God said, and whether he said it to both of them or whether he just said it to Adam. We're not told if Adam added to it. My opinion is Eve was the one that added to it. No. It, like she's going to show up, Satan. No, we can't even, we can't even touch it. That's where drama comes in. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Female drama. That's where that comes in. So at any rate, she added to what God had said. Then she softened God's words by saying, lest you die. But that's not what God said either. God said in chapter 2, verse 17, you shall surely die, or you shall certainly die. And if you remember, we said that, that uh, in the Hebrew, that's repeating die two times. You, you will die, die. The tense of the first one is certainly, for sure, and forever. And the tense of the second one is eternally. So you shall surely die. Eve's words did relate the eternalness of it. The tense of the word die here is eternal death. But it, she is not saying the absoluteness of it or the certainty of it. And he, here, is, here is a great warning for taking Scripture out of context. This is why I'm so adamant about context or rewriting Scripture. I'm always cautious about paraphrases or, or devotionals or readings that changes God's words you know, for, for their own use. And there, there are a number of Scriptures that warn against that. But Satan knew right then that he had it. 
She minimized it. She softened it. She exaggerated. He, he knew that he had her. And so verse 4 says, And the serpent said to the woman, You surely shall not die. Now, how did he say it? Did he say, You're not going to die. Mockingly. Or did he say, You're not going to die. See the authoritativeness? You're not going to die. You're not going to surely... I mean, he uses both words. You're not going to surely die. You're not going to absolutely die. You're not going to eternally die. You're just not going to die. And here Satan openly defies God's word. And so now, Eve has to choose. Who's she going to believe? Will she stand or will she give in? Who's telling the truth? Is it God or is it the serpent? Satan had started out with, with a seemingly sincere question. Did I hear God correctly? And sometimes, I think this is a warning for us. And sometimes we think when someone asks us a question, we think that they really honestly want to know about God or about Jesus or about the Bible or about our faith when really all they want to do is engage us in debate. Uh, you Jesus in, uh, I didn't write down where the scripture was, but in the, I think it's in Matthew, Matthew 8, I think it is. But Jesus said, no, it's Matthew 13. Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. That's what that verse means. It means once we perceive someone's intentions is not pure and all they want to do is try to trap us or trick us, you know, trip us up or, 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 they, they just want to debate. That's when we back off. And, and, and so, you know, I'm, we're just not going to do that. Stop and refuse to debate them. So Eve had to choose. And here's the thing. Her hesitation prompted the certain serpent to continue. So verse 5. He went on to say, For God knows, again, this, this cold calculating God, God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. And, and the word there, then if you're reading from a King James, the you there is again in the plural. He's, he's speaking to both of them. Again, that leads me to believe that Adam is there. But whether he is or not, he's speaking about both of them. Uh, I, I have a note in my Bible that says, listen for the hiss of the serpent from today's pulpits. You know, it, it, all three of our women's groups, I know many of the pastors that you all have. And your pastors are solid. They're sound. But we know that a lot of them aren't. So we have to be careful about the half-truths and, and, and the minimizing and the changing of God's Word. In this, Satan questioned God's motives. He he is implying that God is restricting Eve, that God is keeping something good from her. I mean, how often does that happen today? I mean, a lot. To question God's word at all immediately puts our intellect above God's intellect. Well, wasn't he? It was sort of true. Your yeah. Eyes will be open. Yeah. I mean, they were indeed open. No good and evil. Mm -hmm. won't be like God, but so it's again that manipulation. Yep. I mean, that's a true statement. It is a true statement. So when we get over to that and we we look at that, uh, what he said again, we'll we'll see that the best lies are shrouded in truth. But she doesn't even know what evil is. Right. She doesn't even know what it is yet. So, but we know that it's a lie. But she, he is, the, the thing that he is doing that she should have been able to pick up on is she knows the love that the Lord God has of all the details, always provided, always done for them. And what Satan is doing is um, um, leading her to believe that God is keeping something from her. He's causing her to question God. Whether you know whether she knows anything about good and evil or anything else, he's planting a seed of doubt and causing her to question God's motives and God's actions. 
So, uh, like I said, to, to question God puts our intellect above God. So, how do we, how do we shield ourselves from this type of temptation? Well, I gave it away there. We need a shield. Ephesians six six tells us to take the shield of faith. Here's the I wrote this in in front of uh, Ephesians in my Bible years and years ago, and what I said was, "Don't wait until you understand it to believe it." And that and I, that holds true for the whole Bible. You don't have to understand it in order to believe it. The question is, though, do you do I trust God enough to be able to not have to understand it to believe it? You know, a lot of people, they have to understand it before they believe it. You, you, do, we, do we trust God enough to not have to have that? So look at how the tree is described in verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree, this particular tree, was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. So, yeah, I'm sure if you don't know anything else about chapter 3, that you've heard a sermon probably on on the, on the this verse. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here uh, unless you have questions, but, but I'm just going to throw these few things out. This verse, or the, well, actually this whole verse, has been connected with 1 John 2.16. If you don't know that, you need to write that down. That's a very, very important thing that every preacher that ever preaches on this verse will tell you. 1 John 2.16. In 1 John 2.16, we read about the lust of the flesh. This tree was good for food. The lust of the eyes. It was delightful. It was nice to look at. And the pride of life. It was desirable to make one wise. That Those three things are also compared with Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. He was tempted with food. He was tempted with riches. And he was tempted with ruling. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Achan, another one, a little less known story. But Achan, as you remember the story from Joshua chapter 7, the Israelites, you know, they've gone around Jericho and they're supposed to destroy everything in Jericho. Don't take anything. Because Jericho was supposed to be like the first, first fruits. You give all the first fruits to God. Well, Achan took something. And when they finally found him out, this was his reply. I saw it. I wanted it. I took it. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And that's exactly what Eve did. But notice this. I, I, I caught this a few weeks ago when I was just reading through. Back in chapter 2, verse 9, look at how the trees, all of the trees in the garden were described. All of the trees were pleasing to the sight and good for food. They were all that way. It was just that this one added that uh, desirable to make you wise. But but they were all beautiful. All the trees were good for food. All the trees were a delight to the eyes. But what did Satan corrupt? He corrupted the way the trees were looked at. The trees were a gift to Adam and Eve. You can freely eat. They're beautiful. They have great food. You can You can have all you want of them. He changed that from a gift to a, I was trying to think of a good word for it. All, all I could think of was possession. But I think of all those commercials that come on. You deserve whatever, you know? You're entitled. You're entitled. Yeah, it, well, that's exactly what it was. He changed it from a gift to an entitlement. That's exactly what it was. Now she thinks, eh, hey, yeah. I'm entitled to all of this. Yeah, the tree, the trees didn't change. What changed was how Eve looked at them. So what did this one tree have that the others don't? It has the ability, she saw, to make one wise. Well, what does that mean? What's that word wise really mean? The word here means to have understanding. In other words, to know the why. Don't we always want to know the why? I, do. I want to know the why of everything. But that's what we just said a moment ago. Do we trust God enough to be able to not have to have our whys answered? But she, she wouldn't. Sometimes those things are just not for us to know. And here we see that every sin, 
begins with a thought. I wonder. One of my commentaries said, there's no such thing as a private sin. And we see that here in the rest of that verse, for we see that after she took from the fruit and ate, she get, she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Huh? This reminded me of that scripture in James chapter 1, um, verses 13 through 15, where it talks about when tempted, no one should say God's tempting me. Right. God can't be tempted, but each one is tempted by his own evil desire. He's dragged away and enticed. Then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown or accomplished, gives birth. To that. that that's uh, exactly yeah, what that, that, that's exactly what it, that that progression, and we see that all through Scripture. It, like I said, every sin begins with a thought. Yeah, I wonder what would this be like? What would that be like? And if we entertain the thought, then it grows deeper and deeper within us. Uh, you know, and, and we have to understand first of all before we go on into that, we have to understand that Adam was not deceived. Adam knew exactly what he was doing. Adam chose to eat. We know that from 1 Timothy 2, 4. The New Living Translation puts it this way. And it was not Adam who was deceived by Satan. The woman was deceived and sin was the result. Uh, I, I, I believe in this, Adam committed the sin of idolatry. He wanted to be with Eve more than he wanted to be with God. He chose to eat that. It's, it's, this may sound, I don't mean this to be flippant, but I always think of that, that old song, Night Train to Georgia, you know, where the woman says she'd rather live with him in his world than live without him in hers. That's exactly what Adam was doing. Yeah, sometimes I lay at night and think about these things. What if Adam had said, no, I'm not going to do that. I trust God more. Would God have taken Eve out and given him another helper? You know, what, what if Bathsheba had said to David, don't do this. this. This is not the right thing. You don't want to do this, David. Now, all of these things where there is an opportunity to speak up, and they don't. But but Adam was not deceived. That was the bare sin. Yeah, yeah I, re I really think it was. And he should be, he should be, they should be the ones that have to bear children and all that. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you know, when you really look at what it is they're supposed to be responsible for, it's, you know, yes. I, I'll take my part. <laughs> Thank but, you very you much. You know, if Adam, if he lacked wisdom before the fruit, then did he have the ability to? I don't think wisdom to consciously decide. You know? I don't think wisdom is the key here. I think it's trust. Whether you understand it or but not. Do you not have to have a level of wisdom to understand trust? You know, I don't think so. I mean, maybe in, in some regard, but but I I think trust is it goes along with love. You you know, you may not understand anything about Something, but if you trust the person, what it's, it's a person who's telling you something, you may not understand anything about it. But if you trust them, you don't have to understand, you don't have you just you love them and you trust them enough that you just you, well, you, just, you just take what they say. Well, that uh, totally between a creator and his creation, yeah, we could never. Really grasp the depth. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, well, yeah, you're right. You know, even knowing as much as we know now, we can't grasp that. But that was that was you know, like the they all said you had one job, <laughs> you had one thing not to do, and and, and you did that one thing. So, but he uh, was given the knowledge to name all the animals. So he was he was given some smarts. He was given some some yeah. smarts to be able to intelligence. Uh, the t intelligence that's the word to determine names based on their abilities and so forth so he had to have something going on up there so. uh, uh, you would think maybe, maybe it was the naked woman that said yeah well, maybe, maybe that was it <laughs> and it just that's blinded a lot of people we're not going to go down that road we're on video so whatever you want then, man, <laughs> oh yeah whatever you want 
<laughs> so yeah, let's just leave that alone. Just go on. But but at any rate, at this point, the relationship that we had in chapter two is broken. The relationship is broken. This chapter, chapter 3, we could say is the pivot point of the Bible. From here on out, nothing will ever be the same. You know, our, our pastor is starting a, a series on, on Revelation. And so, yesterday when I, when I opened my Bible to Revelation, the first note that caught my eye, of course I got tons of notes in there, but the first note that caught my eye was one I'd written that said, what was interrupted in Genesis chapter 3 is completed in Revelation 19 through 22. It was interrupted at this point. And from here on to there, we live in a fallen world. And, but, and let me add here, this, and we talked about this a little bit at the beginning. I didn't go into as much depth there in our question, but this was not divine entrapment. This was all about trust and obey. As I said, that's been the theme for this study. Eve disobeys God's one and only commandment. Satan initiated the first two steps, but then Eve's natural desire carried her forward. What she should have done was told Satan, no, I trust God. When Jesus was tempted, he spoke to Satan. It is written. You know, we have the whole counsel of God's word as our sword. But Eve had God's direct warning. Whether she heard God say that or Adam told her, she still had the direct warning. Do not do this. God has always asked people to believe and trust his promises that He that his will for us will result in our blessing. Satan, on the other hand, has always urged us to have the experience. Remember the commercials? Try it. You'll like it. Huh? Nike. 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 Is that what it was? I, I couldn't remember what the commercial was, but yeah. no. But it all began with a look. She was looking, perhaps was looking at the tree, and Satan came in. Even if she wasn't looking at it before he came, she looked at it after he pointed it out. So they took their eyes off the Creator and looked at the Creator. Exactly. Yeah, and I, I was I was looking through some scriptures this morning. That in, in Romans one, where it says they worship creation more than the creator that's exactly what this is yeah so but everything this we said begins with the thought begins with the look we see that in scripture lot looked toward sodom david looked upon bathsheba ananias and sapphira looked at the praise that barnabas was getting because he sold his property and donated the money and they said oh we want some of that too but Satan was right about one thing, as, as we said earlier, their eyes were open. Verse 7, then the eyes of both of them, Adam and Eve, were opened and they knew that they were naked. As we said earlier, the best lies are shrouded in a bit of truth. Satan always adds just enough truth to make the lie believable. Indeed, their eyes were opened. And now they did know evil. But the sad part was, it didn't make them like God. In fact, it broke that relationship. But I was intrigued. Joe and I, were, if we were coming in, uh, getting out of the car, we were laughing about something. And Joe told Lane, says, we have Bible study coming and going. And, <laughs> you know, we have it at night. We have it at the morning. It, we both are reading uh, kind of the, the same commentary on one of the things. And, and Joe said something about uh, that this word naked here is a different word than is used in chapter 2. And I said, yeah, I, I saw that in the commentary, but they didn't tell you the difference. It just was a, it was a different word. Well, you, you know what that does to me. I'm on a mission. i got to find out. Why, 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 is it, why did he use a different word? Why did Moses use a different word? The word for naked in 2.25 is different than the word in 3.7. And so it took me a while to, to dig through and find it. But I finally found it. And here's what it is. In chapter 2, verse 25, it says, They were both naked and were not ashamed. And in verse 7, it says, uh, The eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. The difference is, in chapter 2, verse 27, the two were one flesh. And together, 
they were naked. Then in verse 7, the word indicates the two realized they had naked parts. Just parts of them that they were ashamed about. They were not ashamed at all in chapter 2, verse 25. Now they became aware of their separateness. So then what happened? The rest of verse 7. They sewed fig tree fig trees, fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Now, now they were ashamed in front of one another. As my mother used to say, reality is set in. <laughs> one writer said that they realized that all of mankind was corrupted. Well, maybe that's true. But maybe they thought, we were told to multiply, uh, be fruitful and multiply, and we haven't done that, and now we're going to die. <laughs> I don't know. But think about this. They knew they were naked. But what did they cover? The New American Standard says they made loincloths. King James Version says they made aprons. The NIV says they made coverings. The word literally means a belt. In other words, to gird with. Some of your older King James Versions will say they made, it, they made girdles. But again, what did they cover? Did they cover their faces? No. Did they cover their feet? No. They covered their reproductive organs. That's what they realized, that they were naked. They covered that. God created them, man and woman, suitable for each other, blessed them, told them to multiply. And verse 25 of chapter 2 says, and they were both naked and were not ashamed. But now they are ashamed. And they hid themselves, not only from each other with these coverings, but from God. So the first thing to change was their conception of sexuality. What had been beautiful and innocent and oneness in chapter 2 became a source of shame and embarrassment and separation. Since that day, Satan has corrupted what we called in chapter 1 the inclination and the ability to reproduce. And since that day, the inclination... And the ability has diminished more and more and more. All this you hear about in vitro fertilization, all the people who can't have children, low, low sperm counts, all of that. It's diminishing. The further we go, it's not evolving, we're devolving. But now they, they are ashamed. They hid themselves from each other and from God. So, so how did they cover themselves? Well, it says they sowed fig leaves. Someone said, it's a good thing there was no poison ivy in the garden. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, believe, I believe that this is actually what they did. I mean, this is a, a historical account. This is what they did. But somehow found a way to attach fig leaves together and made some sort of, of covering for themselves. That's, a, that's actually what they did. But it's also symbolic as well. Where did the leaves come from? Tree. Tree. Trees. Trees. Where the trees come from? The, the garden. Yeah, dirt. It comes from the ground. Who sewed them together? Probably Eve. <laughs> You're probably right. <laughs> Mine has a prettier stitch than yours, you know, yeah. But, but they did. They sewed them together. This is a picture of man trying to cover his sin with his own works and using something that he decides to use to cover it with. They decided to take the leaves. They decided to sew them together. They decided to do that. Man trying to cover his own sin. And that never works. But, but let me ask this. Did Adam and Eve die when they ate from the tree? No. 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 Uh, well, yes and no. They didn't die physically, of course, which is what I, I expect that once, once their eyes was open, it was like, uh-oh, you know, just waiting for it to happen. Uh, I, I think they expected that, but 
but they were separated spiritually from God. They may have wished they had been. You know that they may have. They may, yeah. As time went on, they may have. But we'll see encouragement come from it. But but that's right. So now that they're really afraid that they didn't die, but they do realize that, that they are separated. Before now, they had only known the love and care of their Creator. But now their eyes are open, and they see a holy God, and they know that they aren't holy. They're anything but holy. Now, you know, it's a, but let me throw this in, too. It, it was a shame that Adam and Eve felt that, uh, um, excuse me, it was shame, it was their shame that they felt that opened the door to restoration. Because if they hadn't cared, there would have been no restoration. There would have been no hope. Someone cannot be forgiven until they first realize that they're a sinner. This this one guy I listened to a lot of talk, talking about salvation. He said, you can't save anyone until you get them lost first. In other words, they have to understand that they're lost before they understand that they need to be saved. So now, so now look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of of the day. So let's just stop right there. Well, let's see. Since we're not going to get finished anyway, <laughs> let's talk about this verse. How have you always heard this verse taught? And they heard the sound or the voice, your translation may say, of the Lord God, and here's that Lord God, this is the loving Jehovah Elohim, they heard the sound of the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, I know you've heard that taught on. What, what have you heard it taught? I can't say that I've heard it taught. You haven't heard it taught? Well, well it's walk, God walking with them in the cool of the day. <coughs> what comes to mind then? <coughs> well, I think it's just unique how it's made sure that we, we know that it's in the cool of the day mm -hmm. instead of the heat of the day or just in the day or mm -hmm. whatever. Dusky. Yeah, that mm -hmm. word cool. Huh? Dusky evening. Dusky evening. Right. Yeah. right. What, 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 what does this bring to mind? The song. <laughs> Think of that in the garden song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the garden. Yeah. It just coming into his presence like we, we have our daily quiet times. Yep. Yeah. You know, to just have that relationship. <laughs> yeah. Together. He's seeking them. Mm hmm. Which is that song? Yeah. Any other thoughts? I think of Jesus because I could not even picture the Lord God walking. Right. So I think of Jesus. Of Jesus. Yeah, and, and most commentaries, most scholars uh, believe that this is a theophany, that it, that it is the pre-incarnate Christ walking in, in the garden there with them. Now, I, I've always heard this. Uh, if I'm a place here. I've always believed, I mean, you know, as a kid, you know, hearing these stories, I, I just could, could picture... You know, it's like you say, dusky. It, it's it's been a hot day and it's cool in the evening. Yeah. You know, those of us who who live in the country or know what it's like to sit on the porch in the evening when it's cool, or you know, the front porch swing, and all. it's just that whole idea of of the calmness, the cool of the day, and hearing the voice of the Lord, and you know, hearing him him stirring that he's coming to look and to spend time with them. That's how I've always. Picture this, that's how I've always heard this taught. But it surprised me that more than one of the commentaries depicted this scene as a scene of judgment. Now, it will be that, you know, when, when God's, they start hiding and God starts looking for them and, and it turns into to, uh, God uh, confronting them with what they've done. It will be judgment. But just as this begins... It's not different from anything he had done. No, I, I don't. I, I don't see it, especially since it uses Lord God. I've never seen this as being a a a picture of judgment. It's God coming 
to spend time with them. Of course, obviously God knows what they've done and he will confront them, but that this was like, this was a, this was a common occurrence. This is what I think of. I think of, of Enoch. You know, it says that Enoch walked with the Lord and then was no more for the Lord took him. That, that he walked with him. Whether it was a theophany or, or however it was, that's just how I picture this. God was coming like he had done many times before to spend the evening, the cool of the evening with them. So I was really surprised at some of what these words meant. Um, I think, I think, as I said, it becomes a scene of judgment, but I don't think it starts out that way. So they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the evening. In Exodus, the word sound there, your translation may say voice. They heard the voice of the Lord or they heard the sound of the Lord uh, moving in the garden. And, and, and let me let me step ahead here, uh, and, and then I'll back up. The word "cool" there, I don't, I don't. Every translation I looked at used that word, but the word actually is the word for a breeze, like you would hear a breeze rustling in the trees. And it's also the word "breeze" is the word for the spirit. Remember, chapter one, verse three: the spirit was moving over the face of the waters. So breath the breath of life, exactly. So, so they hear this sound of him moving through the trees. Uh, that that word, though, that word for voice or sound is you is used for judgment. The voice of God, the the thunder of the voice in uh, uh, Exodus nineteen nineteen. It's the sound of the voice of thunder. As Moses is going up on Mount Sinai, that word is used for judgment. So I see where they're coming from in those in those uh, uh, commentaries. But and, and even verse ten will indicate that there's something about it that frightened Adam. But the word, as I said, the word "cool the day" is the word for breeze or the spirit, and God God was moving. But many, as we said, many of the commentaries viewed this as a theophany that it was the pre incarnate Christ walking among among the trees. And, and I believe that's what it was. I, I just picture it that way. A physical manifestation of God. And, and, but many of them viewed the word day, the cool of the day, viewed the word day as akin to the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. And I was like, well, that just changes everything I thought about this. But thankfully, many of the other commentaries what. Went, went along with, with the way that I had always believed. So we can we can have differences of opinion that way. But it may have felt like the day of judgment to Adam and Eve. But I'm not sure that was the intention of the verse. But, but whether God was coming in judgment or coming in fellowship, whatever God's intention was, if, if he had been coming every day that way and he's just coming the next day that way, whatever it was, how did Adam and Eve react? Verse, the rest of verse 8 says, And the man and his wife, or the man and the woman, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God, as we said earlier, among the trees in the garden. They went and hid among the trees. Adam and Eve didn't want to look for God anymore. The question is, who hid from whom? And who came looking? Adam and Eve hid from God. But God came looking for them. And the question for us is not where is God, but where are we? You know, the, the, old, the old saying is, if you don't feel close to God, guess who moved? God didn't move. We're the ones that moved. We're the ones that hide. They hid. So what did God do? Verse 9, <clears throat> Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? <clears throat> One commentary said, man has broken away from God, but God will not leave him in his lost condition. God didn't say, hey, you made your bed, now lie in it. No, God came looking for them. And remember, we, we've said this many times in our studies, God never asks a question for his own information. Anytime God asks a question, he is asking it for the person to think about the answer for, for the man's clarification. God does not abandon us 
to our own just desserts, as it says. God questions. He questions with the purpose of getting Adam to see what he has done, to understand what he has done. And notice, who did God call for? He didn't call for Eve. He called for Adam. He called for the man. Why? He's the head of the house. He's it's his responsibility. But don't you think Adam knew that they had done wrong? Oh yeah. I mean they're hiding. Yeah. But he wants him to think about what he has actually done. He hasn't just eaten from the tree. He hasn't just gone along with Eve. He has disobeyed the one and only commandment that God has given him. Think about exactly what it is you have done. And, and, and then Adam, uh, <clears throat> how did Adam reply? Verse 10. And he said, I heard the sound or voice, however your translation has it. I heard, same word as, as in verse 8. I heard the sound of thee in the garden and I was afraid. Adam heard the sound or the voice of God. As I said, it's the same word it's used in verse 8. Now, isn't it interesting how the same voice can be a loving voice at one time when we are obeying and a fearful voice when we are disobeying? It's like when the mom calls you all three names. Yeah, yeah, your whole name. Yeah, that same loving voice can be very, yeah, very fearful. Do you think the voice changes or do we change? I think both. Well, both, both. If it's our mothers, it's but it's both. But it, it's not so much was God called for them. It was the voice that was fearful. It, God didn't change. Where are you? Yeah. Adam was the one who had changed. Because mm -hmm. yeah. it was a loving, you know, it was Lord God. It was yeah. Lord God. Because it was loving. So it was, he was loving. coming to you lovingly. Yeah, he was coming. I, I, I believe that. I don't, I don't believe that. That starts out as judgment. I believe he was coming like he'd been coming and spending time with them. And of course, he he knows what they've done and he knows that they're hidden. But but he calls for them. Where are you? I don't I don't, I don't see you anywhere. And makes them really understand what they what they have done to break that relationship. Adam, it's, it says Adam was afraid, and I have a note in my Bible that says, "Was he afraid because of what he did, or that he got caught?" You know, there, there's a difference there. But the rest of, of verse ten says, I, "I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself." And that's the same word as naked parts, as we saw earlier. And so God asks another question, saying, basically. Being naked is the least of your worries, boy. <laughs> Verse 11. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you, you, you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? I love the next verse. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> it's all God's question was with the purpose of getting Adam to see his separateness from God. To get him to understand the ramifications of what he had done. But notice, Adam didn't answer the question. Adam's uncomfortableness was more important to him than the fact that he had broken God's only commandment. I mean, you know how we are. It's all about us. And, and he said, who told you, you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree? And the man says, the woman... Whom thou givest to be with me, she gave me to eat from the tree, and I ate. She gave me from the tree, and I ate. The sin that Adam had committed was way more serious than its immediate results. What God wanted, when God said, who told you that you were naked? What God really wanted was for Adam to confess. When David sinned with Bathsheba, David said to God, Against thee and thee only have I sinned. Now, a lot of people felt the consequences of what David did. But he had only sinned against God. It's the same, it, the same as it is with us. But then how did Adam reply? She made me. She made me do it. <laughs> she made me do it. 
Uh, and, and God said, well, verse 11 said, who told you that you were naked? In other words, did you, he asks him again, did you or did you not? And God wanted a confession. And Adam didn't answer, but said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Adam was supposed to be the leader. But he became the follower. And he blamed God for it. You gave her to me. You gave her to me. In chapter 2, verse 23, he was ecstatic with this gift. Whoa, man, or however you Whoa, or wow, whatever. This is bone of my flesh. This is flesh of my flesh. He was ecstatic with this gift. And now he blamed God for her? Well, she'd know better. Look at the next verse. Well, we're, we're not going to hardly get to that. He said, the one you gave me, she's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> and one commentary said sin has now divided the family it still it still works that way in the world it does Every so so many people do not take responsibility yeah. for their sin their actions somebody else caused it yeah exactly happen. exactly it's just it, it, it's never about anything that I've done it's always somebody else's fault that, mm-hmm. that's our culture and you know, we're seeing these coming more and these things coming more and more to fruition and and and, and uh, expounding in our own day and, and so uh, I when I got to this point I thought I'm gonna have to quit because if I didn't have time to write anymore and I didn't have time to go on any further but but yeah uh, and I'll she then does the same thing. She blames the serpent, and then God uh, uh, says to the serpent, and then all the cursing from there on. And I really didn't want to have to rush through the rest of that, so I so I cut it off with with the with the statement: sin has now divided the family. So, questions, thoughts. Uh, if, if you look at these these application questions on here, how can you praise God for this chapter? I mean, we're we're still all in the bad stuff. Yeah. <laughs> You know, how, how, how can this chapter encourage you? I'm not real sure how, how so far what we've covered. Betty, do you think of, and I know we don't, we don't know, but did you think of Adam said, I blew it. You gave me everything, and he had been like, I sinned against you. Was it just the, it's her fault. I mean, or is it, just there's no coming back to that. Was it as much as reaction and like Elaine was talking about, there's always somebody else to blame? Yeah. I think that's his initial reaction. I think as we get through the rest of the chapter and uh, and and the curse is given, not, not only are they cursed, but everything's cursed because everything that he was responsible for is cursed. The ground's cursed. The animals are cursed. Everything is cursed because of what he did. We ne- we never see a uh, a confession like that. But I think that we see an a uh, uh, an inkling of that. We never get it in so many words. But but as we said earlier, it, the fact that they were afraid. The fact that they covered themselves, the fact that they felt this guilt and this shame tells us that they knew it was wrong. As we said, if, if they hadn't, oh well, you know, if they hadn't cared, there would have been no hope. But because of that, we see, we will, we will see next time the, uh, uh, the, the very first giving of the good news that this will be, this will be taken care of, that the, the, uh, uh, the the evil will be turned back eventually, but the one thing that the one thing that gives us the idea that that there is a a, a restoration of sorts is in the end there when it says uh, in verse twenty. Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. He has hope at that point that there is going to be children. 
He has hope at that point that the animals are going to reproduce. He has hope at that point that life is going to go on. So there is a restoration of sorts there. We never, we never get the actual confession. We, we don't get the, you know, I'm sorry, I did this, you know, but, but the fact that he names Eve the mother of the living tells us that he has hope for a future, and I think that hope comes from that um, uh, verse 15. The, the enmity between the woman, between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. This serpent, whomever is behind this serpent, of course we know is Satan, but there will be a reckoning, there will be a day of reckoning for that. And, and I think that's what gives him hope. So, any other thoughts or questions? I don't, I don't understand why they were afraid because they've only seen goodness from God. Yeah, but... but or maybe they may have been ashamed of yeah. what they did, but I can't see them being afraid. I, I think that may have come from what, um, what the serpent had... Uh, placed in their mind uh, of God withholding good from them. They now had a fear of God. They wanted to be like Him, and then once they realized, hey, this didn't work, now it's like, oh no, what have we done? And and uh, it, this uh, this fear that, that the serpent had placed in their mind, or this, this uh, thought of God's not good, what is there about him that we don't know? You know, you fear the unknown. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think that probably is what, what that is. Maybe, maybe they feared that they disappointed him. Yeah, yeah, there's that. You know, uh, Joe Jr. once, I don't know how old he was, maybe five, six years old, ran the, uh, the Cub Cadet mower off into the ditch. He'd been told, don't, you can sit on it, but don't mess with it. Well, you know, I messed with stuff. Ran it off in the ditch. He jumped off of it, ran in the house, got in the bed, and pulled the covers up over his head. <laughs> like he was hidden, you know. So They wanted to do the same thing. Yeah, that's exactly what they did. Pull the trees down over them, you know. But, but yeah. But, uh, you know, you know he... I don't know if he was afraid, you know, he was going to get in trouble or, you know, we told him not to. But, you know, there's you're, all of our tendencies is if we do something to, to cover it up in some way. Well, we're or, afraid uh, of what what will come from this. Yeah. The consequences. The consequences. Yeah, the consequences. Exactly. What will come yeah. from like this. I said, was he afraid of because of what he did, because he was naked or afraid that he got because he got caught? I think he was afraid because he got caught. Yeah, and what are going to be the consequences? And so, disappointment. And disappointment. Yeah, that I think that that was a big part of it too. So that's as far as I could get with it. I've got more notes than I could ever have time to get together. Even on this part, I left out a lot. But but anyway, any other thoughts before we close? That God is a loving God, and how He's orchestrating all of that together. You know, where He's right. even though you know we we sin. But he comes back so lovingly. Yeah. You know, and He's the one that hunted for yeah, Adam and Eve. He yeah. comes hunting for us, drawing us back. That's right. So that's, when we want to hide. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's that unconditional love. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your word. The words in your word are so exciting.